So here I'm presenting Atsa Machedi, who is the chairperson of the Organization for Women's Liberation from Iran. So in this interview topic, this discussion, she will talk about what is going on in Iran, what is the main theme of the current revolution in Iran, what the people wanted in Iran, and some other interesting topics. So let me first check with the first question. So, so Asa, could you tell me what is the main thrust of the religious fundamentalism in Iran like? So we know it is under the religious regime. And we know that before the religious regime, it was under the Shah regime as well. So can you describe what is the difference between these two regimes or which one, like sort of the operations under these regimes? Can you describe any of those similarities and differences maybe? Well, yes, Iran has been under dictatorship all throughout history. And let's look at back to the let's hundreds something years. And we've had um, two revolutions, quite a few uprising and you know protest popular movements. And now we're going through another one. And um, so there was another monarchy before the revolution of the sort of beginning of the 20th century, and then uh, Britain organized a coup d'etat. I'm just going to jump over, you know, yeah. there is not time, so I'm just going to give you the main points. Uh, Britain organized a coup d'etat and brought uh, Reza Pahlavi, uh, who was the father of the Shah, who, who was overthrown by the previous revolution. He came to, to, uh, to power. He was a soldier, just an ordinary soldier. <clears throat> he took power through a uh, coup d'etat organized by Britain. And then it was, um, you know, of course, a dictatorship, a lot of people killed, imprisoned and stuff. But what he tried to do it was she tried to push back the religious establishment, not get rid of them completely, just push it back because it was a process of uh, bringing capitalism to Iran and capitalism, as it happened throughout history, they had to sort of at first uh, get rid of the extra weight of the religion. It was not like, for example, France or anything like that, but anyway, pushed it back a bit, tried to cut down um, the roles and the, of the mullahs or clergy, if you like, and um, talked about women should be without the veil. So in sort of enforcing um, no veil on the society. and. Um, Something that now the monarchies are trying to say, oh, see, this is what our father did, which, I mean, anyway. And then um, he, in the Second World War, he sided with Hitler. He was about to sign some, you know, uh, more kind of uh, alliances with Hitler. Then um, the, um, I think it was the allies, Britain, and they, they took, they got rid of him. They, they banished him to Johannesburg, if I'm not mistaken, in South Africa, and brought his son to power. And then uh, in 1953, um, there was this sort of nationalist prime minister who wanted to uh, nationalize the oil, which anyway, at that time was the main problems. The, the imperialist power, they wanted the oil, and he wanted to nationalize it. So this time, CIA, with the help of Britain, organized another coup d'etat, took the prime minister away, and brought the Shah's son, which is Mohammad Reza Pahlavi, to power. So that was 1953. From 1953 to 1979, which we had another revolution, he you know, really established his power with iron fists in the society. His secret police was really... Um, you know, a notorious, and a lot of torture, a lot of, you know, executions, a lot of political prisoners, especially leftists and Marxists. And um, he, has, you know, got a lot of wealth himself. When he left Iran, they say he took with him $2 billion. You're talking 1979. Yeah. 
forty something amount. years ago, two billion is I don't know how much would be at this hour. It was huge. Yeah. And that was and then he had already a lot of assets outside, palaces and houses and property and all of that. And he took the uh, sort of royal jewelry. That's I mean people's jewelry. He took them all with him. So now his family owns all of that. His family still are among the maybe ten richest families in the world. And so in around 1978, a sort of pop a um, protest started, a protest movement started against the Shah, against the uh, Sabak, which was his uh, secret police uh, abbreviated name. And uh, people came to the street and gradually they started shouting, death to the Shah, death to the Shah, death to the Shah. Then the main slogan you would hear was death to the Shah and nothing really, nothing else. So the protest really grew. I remember in the end of summer 1978, um, he, in one day in Tehran, the army just started shooting at people's demonstration, just right there. And there was a talk of more than 3,000 killed. You never know exactly the correct number, but that was huge and that was real. And then he had the stage of emergency and then all of that. So finally, what happened, the West realized that the Shah's days are numbered and there is a strong left inside the country. There is a lot of what I call leftist aspiration, not leftist organization. Now, leftist parties in a dictatorship, it's very difficult for you to create an organization when anything you do, you're tortured and killed. And also it was the Cold War. And so, so there was Soviet Union next door. And then the US decided to organize a regime change and brought the West with, with, with it. Um, that time, Berzhinevsky well, had this uh, thesis of green belt, mean green symbolizing Islam. So you would have the green, that means Islam in the Middle East against the Soviet Union. And before that, they had already done it in Afghanistan. They had brought the Mujahideen because then there was a regime in Afghanistan which was um, pro-Soviet. And Soviet Union got into the war and then he had to cool back and Mujahideen were in Afghanistan. Uh, so they have already done it in one country, <clears throat> decided to bring Islamists into Iran. And they succeeded. Khomeini then was in exile in Iraq. Uh, they asked Saddam Hussein to send him out for, you know, with some bogus yeah. reasons, so he could be accessible to the media. And so this way he could be transferred to people's minds, if you like. So this, he sent him to Paris. Uh, a, a merchant, a rich mer Iranian merchant, had this mansion in Par uh, close to Paris, Louvre Chateau. They took him there every single day. BBC, Voice of Liberty, all those Western and also um, the Israeli. Farsi uh, broadcasting. They interviewed him. They they sent news. They sent his. They read his leaflets and his press releases. It was it was amazing. Over less than a month, they made him a leader. A leader was born. Someone not young people didn't even know him. You know he was he was someone at my, my father's generation. He had opposed the Shah. But he had not opposed the Shah from a progressive point of view. He had opposed the Shah saying, why did you give votes to women? Why did, you know, why are you taking religious uh, um, properties and assets away from them? This was his main opposition. So anyway, to make the long story short, they brought him back. They brought the uh, Islamists back to, and there were CIA members for coming with him, Iranians. But working for CIA, people didn't know. And he, he became the leader and people were gullible. I'm sorry to use that word, but 
media, Western media managed to make him a leader. And then many leftists then were anti-imperialist and populist, so they accepted it. They were only a small part of left. Like I was working with one of them, very small organization. We, of course, were against it. We were going to the demonstrations. Then I remember uh, in fall, um, just before the Shah left, and uh, they were asking us to observe the vague already. And me and my some of my comrades we were discussing, arguing why. Da, da, da. So then finally, the US took the Shah out of Iran. And Islamic regime came to power. So this was the second and the most important and biggest Islamic regime in in the Middle East. And then you had Iraq, Afghanistan, Taliban, uh, Al Qaeda, uh, Daesh. They're all U.S. There. Everyone knows that now. Okay. So then, from the day one, all we Marxists had to fight with this regime. And uh, there was an uprising in February, so uh, mostly leftists. They took arms from their soldiers. They went to the jails. They freed their comrades who were in jail, who still remained in jail. And then what happened on 8th March 1979, we leftist women working in different women organizations were organizing a eighth march meeting assembly or whatever you want to call it that was the first one maybe long time ago there were a couple of eighth march i don't know it is not written it's not documented but under the shah eighth march was not allowed so that was the first free eighth march we had and we left this we were very young of course yeah. <laughs> we left the marxist uh, try to organize. I remember in Tehran, the capital, there were like four or five different meetings in different universities. We were working hard for these meetings, but and so the leaflets were everywhere, posters were everywhere, and the regime knew that this is happening, so they had to kill it in the butt. So what they did on, at six or seven o'clock in the morning, the radios broadcast Khomeini's uh, uh, um, sort of rule, ruling that in all public institutions, public workers, women had to observe the veil. So the veil mm. became ob obligatory, compulsory for public female workers. And that day, women just ran to the streets. It was incredible. That was a very important historical moment. The first ever protest against the regime, a mass protest. There were thousands of women in Tehran. And um, it was snowing. It was really incredible day. I never forget that day. So we were all on the streets of Tehran, opposing this ruling, saying that we, we want freedom, we want equality for women. And I remember that Khomeini was keep talking against the West, against the East, so East meaning Soviet Union, West, okay, so saying no to East, no to West, and there was this beautiful slogan saying women's freedom is neither Eastern nor Western, but universal, if you like. So it was, it was incredible, incredible what happened that day. And then we had one week of protest movement, sittings, meetings, protests, Finally, the regime had to back off. At that time, it was not strong enough. It backed off. It came back again in a year. It backed off. Finally, by um, 20th of June, I think it would be, uh, 1981, um, it was a kind of a coup d'etat like. If you like, it was the whole regime itself, but the action was like a coup d'etat, like, for example, what happened in Chile. They just rounded up everybody that who was protesting on the streets and kids 10 years old. 
leftists and anyone who protested against them. There was an Islamic organization called Mujahideen. They were first very much allied with the Khomeini, but then there were some issues. They sort of separated. And uh, so they were protesting as well. They just rounded up everybody and took them to prison. And it was a bloody coup d'etat. In a de decade that followed, from like 1981 to 1989, perhaps, or 1988, you never know how many, but they're talking about 100,000 executions or death under torture. Horrible tortures, horrible tortures. And kids, as I said, 10, 12, 13, 14, just were moment you know executed or died under torture and so that decade is a very dark and bloody decade and um, that's when for example me and my partner Mansu Hekmat we had to, we went to Kurdistan first uh, to escape the sort of Richard. being taken and you know being imprisoned and then we, we came to to Europe and you know this whole movement so and, but from like then in maybe ten few years later, the young generation started asking for more freedom, and of course, women's rights were always among the top issues against the veil and against gender apartheid. These two issues were very important. And so when you look at it, you have two dictatorships, the Shah and Islamic regime. It's, a, it's capitalism in what you might call the countries which are, they call it underdeveloped, less developed or dependent kind of. So you can not really have capitalism in those countries because they de depend on cheap labor, you cannot have freedom or democracy in any sense. So dictatorship becomes the main thing. If you look at the whole world, except the Western world, you have dictatorship everywhere and you've had it. And this is how it works. And it was same in Iran. And once people up, um, re re revolted against the monarchy and wanted to get rid of that dictatorship, there was a regime change by the West, by US, brought another dictatorship into the country and killed many, hundreds of thousands, if you just think about how many people they killed. And uh, this time before was both nationalism and religion as two main ideology of capitalism. This time was basically Islam, religion, and then gradually they needed to bring nationalism in because people are becoming disillusioned, or disillusioned maybe is not the right word, but they very soon they saw who is ruling the country and protests were starting. And now, and we've had, every few years we've had protests, large protests, they've been crushed. In 2009, we had a big one, it was crushed. Before that, few years before that, we had one, it was crushed. And then since almost five years ago, like, since December 2017, the, the country has not been the same. We've had waves of protest crushed a few months back, starting again. We've had workers' strikes, we have workers' protests, we've had a lot of activists and workers taken to jail, in prison, free, taken to jail, tortured. So in the past five, almost five years, there have been constant protests. Two years ago, the same month now, in November, there was a big one week or 10 days protest, really militant, and then was crushed again. But this time is different. It's already 50 days, and it's going strong, and it's very progressive, and the young generation is not giving up, and it seems like this time is the last time. That is a really great insight.
I feel like I'm telling a short course on the UN revolutions. <laughs> that is a really insightful thing. That is really great.